Okay, so here we are. Um, some of you I know, there are many of you whom I don't know. My name is Penny Wright, and I am in charge of adult programs here at this library, and today is a special one for, a very special one for us. And before we begin, I want to thank the person without whom this would not be happening, and that is Maria Lacoste. <laughs> Where is she? <laughs> so, Maria is, is a, a beloved patron. We've known her for many years, and she arrived at the library one day and said, I am playing tennis with a gentleman who you, you really must meet and you might want to have here at this library. So, of course, we looked into who this guy was, and we agreed, and we invited him, and he said yes, and here we are. And, and thank you for being here. Now, I know this guy has more friends than I think anyone we've ever had here. So many of you know him very well, but there must be a couple of you who don't play tennis with him. <laughs> As I did. And, I, and for those of you, i just tell you a few things about him. This is a very modest uh, introduction, by the way. Uh, starting in 1966, David Alpern has been a reporter, a writer, and a senior editor at Newsweek magazine. After earlier stints at the pre-Murdoch New York Post, the Daily Journal of Elizabeth, New Jersey, and UPI. At the magazine, David Alpern worked mostly in the national affairs and international sections, but also coordinated the Newsweek poll of public opinion at home and abroad. And he created exclusive first excerpts of newsmaking books. In 1982, he launched Newsweek on Air, the weekly hour-long network radio broadcast, later also a podcast, was heard across the country and also around the world via Armed Forces Radio. It featured interviews with Newsweek staffers and the newsmakers they wrote about. Thirty years later, as Newsweek hit hard times, Alpern took the show independent and nonprofit as for your, your ears only. Its first funding came from the National Arts Club in Manhattan and subsequent foundation support and listener donations until 2014 when the nonprofit Internet Archive agreed to post past shows back to 1982, roughly 10,000 interviews. We won't be hearing every single one of them. <laughs> now a full-time resident of Sag Harbor, David Alpern moderates foreign policy discussions for the John Germain Library there, writes book reviews for the East Hampton Star, and plays a lot of what he calls nearly tennis. Please welcome David Alpern. So, thank you, Penny. Thank you all for coming, even the few I don't play tennis with, every, <laughs> even those I don't know at all. Um, so nearly 10,000 interviews. Let me get my phone going here so we can get this show going. Okay, good. Uh, 10,000 interviews. And uh, people often ask, which was your favorite? And with no disrespect to other guests, uh, dead, alive, even here with us tonight, the answer is no contest. Here's a clue. Okay, you got it. Uh, it was the day when, after repeated requests, my longtime co-host Warren Levinson and I were invited to the East Side townhouse where Catherine Hepburn lived to talk about her memoir of filming the African Queen with Bogart, uh, about to be excerpted in the magazine. We brought a dozen red roses. She offered us each a glass of water, saying, in case you choke with that off-screen tremor, which made it no less alarming. But it was Hepburn who choked. Uh, when Warren asked the first question and pointed his little boom microphone at her, she complained, I can't possibly talk with that thing in my face. <laughs> Catherine Hepburn Mike shy after all those years in Hollywood. But of course, 
because in Hollywood the microphones are way above the set so that they're not on camera. Uh, fortunately, I was making what I hoped was going to be a little bootleg cassette for myself on my Sony Walkman with a little included tie-pin microphone, and I said, uh, Miss Hepburn, can, I, can we pin this to your sweater? She says, well, of course, it's better than talking with that thing in my face. So I did it with my own hands, which I have washed since. Um, having to use that little microphone means that the quality of this particular most favorite interview is the poorest that you will hear in this whole program, but hey, it's Catherine Hepburn. So uh, we started up asking her about the memorable scene of Bowie emerging from the water covered with leeches, then about the ups and downs and fears of her long career. hip joints on a nearby coffee table that she was considering for another replacement surgery and about her tennis game that she hoped more surgery would improve. Power behind the serve, that's my ideal, is what she said. Uh, then she personally pushed all our chairs back to their proper places against the wall and led us down to the door. Afterwards, I sent her what I wrote must be the least expensive gift she'd ever received one of those little rubber racket vibration absorbers, <laughs> explaining that I had not seen one in the picture of her on court that Newsweek could run. Uh, somewhere I have her thank you note, but I can quote it from memory. Dear David Alpern, I feel no vibration, I feel only desperation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your interest in tennis, the book, and me, Catherine Hemp. Uh, of course, uh, the show, the radio show, was generally more about hard news, uh, reflecting each week's magazine. Uh, the biggest story that I had worked on in print, Watergate, seems especially resonant just now in our nation's uh, peculiar, perhaps perilous, political situation. Uh, it began a decade before Newsweek on air, but on several occasions we looked back with those more directly involved, most notably Washington Post reporters uh, Bob Woodard and Carl Bernstein. One conversation was prompted by a TV movie from uh, one of their books, The Final Days. So first, uh, Bob, and then Carl. You must like me. That's why they're here. It backs up. Happily, uh, Newsweek uh, was able to get Bob Woodard and Carl Bernstein
totally uh, go against uh, the oath of office he had taken to uphold the Constitution. And that we've never had anything like that happen in our history before. And I think that, that this TV movie uh, makes it clear uh, the enormity of, of what he did in this regard. At the, at the same time, and, and I think that, uh, that indeed, that, uh, that had, had, would it happen again today, that, that probably the same result would happen, that, that he would have to leave office. That what, what the movie does, as the book does, is that it, it shows uh, an empathic view of, of, of the man's human situation. Here's the first man in our history trapped uh, in, uh, by his own acts, uh, and reacting to to being closed in on, and it's a, at, at moments it's very sad and compelling, uh, just as it was in the book that we wrote. Uh, we also look back at Watergate and its legacy with Catherine Graham, who was publisher of the Post and Newsweek. In general, when you have a story that is very exciting, it's exclusive for about five minutes. And then everybody piles on, and it's not exclusive anymore. And with Watergate, um, it was exclusive for June to more or less the end of the summer. So what made the pressure of being alone on it uh, great was that you thought, if this is such a wonderful story, where is everybody else? Carl Bernstein has talked about being concerned about his personal safety at one point, and I gather you were warned by some friends not to be alone, physically, literally. Can you recall those feelings? Yeah, I didn't take that too seriously, to be honest. What I did take seriously was, there, was the threats made against the company. And those were um, threats against our television station licenses that made our stock plummet. And then there were other threats. They, tried, they cut off access to everybody in the White House. They wouldn't answer our phones. They wouldn't let anybody come over here to editorial lunches. They wouldn't let anybody come to my house to dinner, which was not exactly the worst threat in the world. <laughs> but um, the role of the press was to keep the story alive when they were trying to hush it up. The thing that brought the president down was proper constitutional procedures, which was the courts and the grand juries and finally the the committees of Congress. The role of investigative reporting clearly became um, more important, but I think that it was overdone for a while. I mean, I think everybody in the world, all the young people in the world, went to journalism school and wanted to investigate everything, and I think they overdid it. I think you have to investigate things. You have to be um, skeptical. But um, you shouldn't be vengeful, and you, sh you have to be fair, and you have to be careful. Uh, it was an honor and a privilege to work for Kay. She was key to the very existence of Newsweek on Air. Uh, the show grew out of a once-a-week guest spot uh, for one of our writers or reporters on New York City radio station WMCA, owned by R. Peter Strauss of the Macy's family and Ellen Sulzberger Strauss of the New York Times family. And Ellen became furious when she learned that we were arranging to become an independent national show on the old RKO radio network. And uh, she told me she would have to complain to Kay, who was her friend on and off the court. So I had to race to get a memo to Kay first. And God bless her, the boss lady replied a few days later, of course we must make the leap and please keep her informed. And as it happened, Mrs. Strauss never did complain just wanted to make me nervous or crazy. And Kay herself came on the show, as you heard, every time we asked. A footnote, after Ellen Strauss died, Peter married a woman that I'd seen him with at some Manhattan party, Marsha Lewis. She became more famous later for her daughter by a previous marriage, Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> uh, continuing our coverage of hard news in retrospect, we got a view of the Cuban Missile Crisis from uh, White House speechwriter Theodore Sorensen recalling intimate moments with President John Kennedy. Beautiful. At first we talked somewhat uh, sardonically about uh, some of the people and characters involved, but then he turned very serious, nothing light about it, which was unusual for him because he was very good at laughing at himself in serious situations. And he talked about the fact that children 
how so valued the two little children of his own. Children would be paying the biggest price if there was an outbreak of war, nuclear war, because they had their whole lives to lose, and yet they were totally innocent of bringing about this Cold War situation. There's nothing hollow about the Soviet military in 1962. They possessed uh, plenty of nuclear weapons. Uh, they possessed uh, some enough uh, missile power to deliver those nuclear weapons. When we see the Soviet system in the form of a decrepit Russia falling apart uh, today, uh, it's easy to think that uh, that was just a paper tiger back then, but we know it was done. It was unbelievable on Sunday morning to wake up and find that uh, in response to uh, the letter delivered the night before, that Khrushchev had agreed to withdraw the missiles, to withdraw them under inspection. The atmosphere was one of, of pride and joy. I remember talking in his office with the president just outside the cabinet room before the final meeting of our ex for that week. And one of his assistants came up and said, now, Mr. President, you can settle the India-China dispute. The president said, no, he didn't think he would be very welcome there. Ah, the assistant said, but today you're 10 feet tall. Yes, said JFK, that will last about two weeks. Another inside view of international conflict came from Kay Graham's good friend Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense for Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. It included the first broadcast version of his mea culpa memoir, In Retrospect, The Tragedy and Lessons of Vietnam, which Newsweek also excerpted. In the Johnson administration, those of us who participated in the decision on Vietnam, we acted according to what we thought were the principles and the traditions of our country. And we made our decisions in the light of those values. But we were wrong. We were terribly wrong. And George Shultz, in commenting on, on it uh, a couple of years ago, said it was very important not to learn the wrong lesson from Vietnam. And by that, he simply meant that that uh, Cap Weinberger, the, the Secretary of Defense, while George was Secretary of State, had in a sense concluded we should never uh, accompany uh, U.S. diplomatic moves by the use of military force or threat of use of military force, other than in situations comparable to, I'll say, World War II. It's the combination of military force or threats of military force and diplomacy situations such as we have in Bosnia today uh, should be excluded from U.S. foreign policy. George Shultz said that was the wrong lesson. I very much agree with George. There are several that apply today. One of them is don't ever apply U.S. military, economic, or political power unilaterally, except in the narrow case of defending the continent of the U.S. In Vietnam, we did, in a very real sense, apply our power unilaterally. The French wouldn't go along, the Germans wouldn't go along, the Japanese wouldn't go along, the British wouldn't go along. We're not on mission. We acted as though we thought we were. And when we've applied U.S. power unilaterally, we frequently make mistakes. That's one lesson. One of the mistakes we both made was to misunderstand our opponent. And that is a mistake we run the risk of making in the future. We don't understand Iraq the way we should. We don't understand Muslim fundamentalism the way we should. We must understand our opponents better than we did in Vietnam. And our opponents, by the way, must understand us much, much better than the North Vietnamese made. They made as many mistakes as we did. Uh, McNamara's prescience about Muslim fundamentalism uh, was brought home, literally and figuratively, by the suicide attacks of 9-11, 2001, uh, which led to short-lived political unity, as you may remember, and then increasing division and continuing drama. Barack Obama's historic election, selection as the first major party African-American presidential nominee led to endless replay of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Robert Caro, the Pulitzer Prize winning Lyndon Johnson biographer, remembered another speech and the MLK LBJ Obama connection. They made as many mistakes as we did. It was quite uh, one of the most dramatic moments in 20th century political history. They were marching down in Selma, men and women and children being beaten by the police, getting up and marching again, and singing the great 
civil rights hymn, We Shall Overcome. Everyone said that Lyndon Johnson could never get a Voting Rights Act through Congress because of the Southern strength. He stood up before Congress and he said, it's not just Negro, it's his, his word. It's not just Negroes, but really it is all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And he paused and he said, and we shall overcome. At that moment, it would keep the President of the United States had in effect joined the voices of all those who were singing that hymn down in Selma and across the South and saying, he as President would fight for that. David, you know, when uh, Martin Luther King was listening to the speech, he was in the living room of a local family in Selma. And when Lyndon Johnson said, we shall overcome, Martin Luther King started to cry. His aide had never seen Dr. King cry before during all the years of struggle. It was as if he realized that now he had a president of the United States on his side. You know, you needed both of them. You needed the heroism and struggle of the black men and women across the South and across America for civil rights to create this rising tide of national feeling. But you also needed someone with the legislative genius and really the, the, the savage will to get things done of the Lyndon Johnson to push that act through against the Southern power in Congress. And that's what we finally had, this partnership. Uh, we talked with Bob Caro. Well, I should say that I actually had an encounter with LBJ um, as a college intern one summer at United Press International uh, in New York. And ask me about it later, but let's continue. We talked with Bob Caro half a dozen times over the years, including to kick off a special Newsweek feature on famous writers and how they write. In Bob's case, crafting history with the same readability as a novel. Well, he's been writing as long as I can remember, and I guess the proof of that is I found the manuscript of a uh, short story I wrote in either the fifth or sixth grade called Hunk the Moose, and interestingly, <laughs> it was basically a biography the story of a moose growing up, what I'm trying to do. I, all my books are sort of about political power, one form or another, and when you get right down to it, I, it's, I try to find out how it works in the Senate or wherever. Well, the research is always the best. It's always fun finding things out. I love to sit in libraries like the Lyndon Johnson Library and go through the documents there. That's fun. Then trying to write and say exactly what you mean, um, that's, not, <laughs> that's not fun. And it also requires, often requires you to write things over and over and over again. Well, that's because you want your books to endure and I mean if you find out if you search I don't say I do but if you find out something you think people should understand about how political power works in America because after all in a democracy we confer political power so the more we understand about it presumably the better our government will be if you find out something you don't want to just tell the people at the moment you want to be able to tell succeeding generations to do that, the writing has to endure, and I feel that the level of writing that endures has to be the same in nonfiction as in fiction. It really has to be at the same level. A novelist, Bob says he reads and rereads for pleasure and for his craft is John le Carre. Uh, we spoke at the end of the Cold War and consequently the end of the George Smiley family of spies and counter spies that some of us found so seductive. But spying itself, Le Carre assured us, would never go out of fashion in fact or fiction. The condition of a spy is one in which to some extent we all live, uh, whether in relation to the institutions we work for, the firms, the corporations we work for, uh, within, within marriage, with outside marriage. All of us have secret lives that we're aware of. We often think we're the only people who live them, but in fact most of us, to one way, to one extent or another, share those secret lives. And, and so perhaps the universality of my stuff in some way speaks to the unexpressed part of us. I think that, it, that, it, that certainly in my case, it was always necessary to pull back from the reality in order to make one's stories credible. I mean, if you take, for example, the Watergate affair, 
If I'd set out to write a story about a president who bugged himself by mistake, I would have been ridiculed. Um, and, and so it goes in the espionage business. If I'd written a story about about flying cakes to Tehran, really people would have said the carrier's lost his mind. Um, I, I really had to find uh, a much more modest context for my stuff. I think the fun will be for those who write in the genre uh, to to break the pieces up, to listen and watch history in the making, and to readjust to whatever comes along in the future. I think what one must bear in mind is that the prospect of, break, of peace breaking out uh, in no way it suggests that, that espionage will, will be run down as an industry, quite the reverse. I mean, if your former enemy is breaking into pieces and you don't know which way the pieces are going to jump, you must buy the living daylights out of him. Uh, what I do know is that uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to face the future of Perestroika and look for other theatres and other political situations uh, to write about. I'm very glad to be given a whole new deck of cards. I must say the only thing better than reading your books is hearing you read them. I, I gather you just won one of your one of the books that you've read on tape has just won a prize for that, and I don't think anybody does uh, does your uh, your work and and all of the voices as well as you do. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I can do bad noises too, but I won't do them. Uh, that interview was pegged to publication of the Russia House. Uh, Le Carre's first novel after actually visiting Moscow, which he could not safely do earlier because of his prior incarnation on Her Majesty's Secret Service, if you'll forgive the you know, Fleming reference. Uh, years later, uh, with little hope, I emailed the link to that chat to info at lecarre.com. That's how close we are. And got back, surprisingly, a thank you note from the man behind the famous pen name, David Cornwell himself. We talked about the right stuff in space and on film with Tom Wolfe, elegant, often electrified author of the book on which the movie was based. I can do bad noises too, but I won't do them now. <laughs> I think they'll come alive. Uh, the problem at the beginning of the space program when the astronaut story was told only by Light magazine was that they were, were quite unbelievable. Uh, they were all uh, presented as the carbon copies of John Plant. Plant's personality back then, when we're talking now about 1959, 1960, 61, uh, was the dominant personality of the original seven astronauts. Uh, he was much more at ease uh, in front of a television camera, much more at ease in, in, in a press conference, uh, much more articulate uh, in any of these public situations. So that when he would speak out uh, for God, for country, and for family, as he did uh, without, this, without any hesitation and quite sincerely. Uh, this became the picture of, uh, of, of the astronaut. And the others began to live with this. And they were fighter jocks, as they say in the military. They had the, they had the streets and the foibles of, uh, of fighter pilots who people, they work hard, they also like to to play hard, that they are the, the modern cavalrymen with all of those uh, rakehell uh, uh, overtones of, of the, of the cavalrymen of, of, of old. And all of that was, all of that side of their lives, which is to say the normal, young, um, animal energy of the, of the, of the fighter pilot, was sanitized. Um, and it was, not, it was not any conspiracy by NASA to uh, make the original astronauts seem like uh, saints in the sky. It, it just happened. It happened because of the time of John Glenn. He was, in fact, an exception uh, in, in the group. And I would like to, to say that uh, it will make him president, because that makes me, in part, a kingmaker. I'd like to have, I'd like to have that reputation. I want it to be known that, uh, that, that, that uh, I can make the president of 88 also. I mean, why stop here? Um, if we are in 1984, in some sort of uh, desperate or very serious confrontation with the Soviets, it seems to me that the picture of Glenn as a man who is strong in crisis, and that certainly, he, he certainly has that picture in, in, in the movie. I just saw it two days ago, and I know it's 
quite struck by that. Um, but I think that would I think that would help it considerably. Nancy Reagan is hardly considered a writer, but my turn, her autobiography with William Novak was revealing, perhaps more than she intended, as was the way she talked about it with us. And the person, which was the whole reason for writing it. Uh, because during the, the eight years, I never said anything uh, about uh, things that were said about me. And, uh, um, and I hope to straighten out a lot of things that I didn't feel that I could say at the time. I tried very hard not to be uh, vindictive, uh, but there's a fine line. You have to you have to walk when you're writing a book like this. You try, on the one hand, that it not be self-serving, and on the other hand, that it not be vindictive. And all you want to do is is just set the record straight about a lot of things that uh, have been not straight. You know, every family has problems. Every family has problems. But to try to solve them when they're on the front pages of the papers every day, then it's very difficult to solve them um, without there being a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of hurt feelings that you could, that could have been avoided. Um, the children have not read the chapters, although I have told them what's in the chapters. Um, I had my son, Ron, uh, told me that I had, to, I had to go a little bit farther with him than I had gone, which I, which I did. My relations with uh, Mike, Maureen, and, uh, and Ron are great. I mean, this. <laughs> There's no problem at all. No, no. Uh, clearly, Mrs. Reagan didn't appreciate that being vindictive is also being self-serving. <laughs> More stunning for all the assurance of good relations with the Reagan offspring, Mike, Maureen, and Ron, was her omission of daughter Patty, the one child who was for years a very public problem. Uh, the next voice is one I often imagine speaking the first stories I wrote for Newsweek for added credibility. But I never imagined both Walter Cronkite and I began with the same career goal, as he noted, uh, talking about his memoir, A Reporter's Life. A good uh, competitive newspaper somewhere in the country. The bigger the city, the better. So I probably was dreaming of New York, maybe the World Telegram. I never did say just one of the Houston Press. We would have been competing for the job. Uh, I think that if I brought any strengths to uh, television news and uh, an evening news program, it probably was the newspaper experience. I don't think that uh, if you put together an evening news broadcast, there should be very much difference between that and being managed editor of a newspaper. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wanted the title of managing editor when I went to the evening news, and uh, it got copied a lot around the country after that uh, in a more meaningless form, I think. I believe the most successful anchor people and uh, news broadcasters are those who aren't concerned about appearances, aren't attempting to perform, but are really desperately attempting to be understood as they deliver the news. You say at the end of your book that you don't feel you made a difference, that the whole nation thought you helped it through the JFK assassination. Lyndon Johnson saw your report on the Tet Offensive in Vietnam as proof of vanishing public support. Uh, you helped focus serious attention on the Watergate scandal that led to the only resignation of a president. Uh, Off-screen in speeches and interviews, you helped start a backfire against Vice President Spiro Agnew's media bashing in the 70s. Isn't that making a difference? Well, I think that... That sort of thing probably made a difference. I, I uh, didn't state myself very well in the book. I think some standards that I think uh, we set down in the early stages of uh, television news broadcasting uh, have sort of gone by the wayside in recent years. And that's where I, but I meant to say I felt that maybe we didn't make a difference after all. We can talk more about the state of the media, but let's move on. Here's another former print journalist, Nora Ephron, a reporter at the old liberal New York Post when I was a copy boy and a campus stringer there, later a fabulous essayist and filmmaker in the Ephron family tradition. Uh, Co-host Catherine Herzog and I began by asking Nora 
if she had laughed or cried as she wrote her latest book, I Feel Bad About My Neck and Other Thoughts on Being a Woman. But I meant to say, I told them that maybe we didn't make a difference after all. Thank you, David. I don't think I was laughing or crying. I definitely felt when I got into my 60s that nothing I read about being in your 60s had the remotest connection to what I was feeling. I kept looking around at you know, girlfriends, I was having lunch with girlfriends, right? We are not girls, but you know, all of us wearing turtlenecks practically up to our noses or <laughs> scarves so that we look like sort of Catherine Hepburn in On Golden Pond or Mandarin jackets so that we look like a version of the Joy Luck Club. And I just thought, no one is writing about this. People write these books and they say, oh, it's so great to be older because you're so wise. And I just thought, what are they talking about? Well, what is so bad about your neck? And isn't it something, a little makeup or a plastic surgery? Who are you? you? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> neck is the first thing to go. And you can kind of do all sorts of preemptive strikes against recognizing that fact, like failing to look in the mirror for several years. Or when you do look in the mirror, you do that pathetic thing that many of us do, which is that you sort of gently pull the skin up, hoping that that's what you look like, or you just kind of straighten your neck like some sort of fabulous swan. But at some point, you're going to catch a glimpse of it. Some, some really loving friend will send you a picture of yourself blowing out the candles on your 65th birthday cake, and you'll want to shoot yourself, uh, because there it is. I mean, I write in the book that you have to cut open a redwood tree to see how old it is, but you wouldn't have to if it had a neck. <laughs> now, not all women do hate their person. They're, the world is full of women who have unnatural attachments to their purses, but and spend huge sums of money on them. But I look in my purse, and I'm sorry to say, I see myself. I see the complete and total disorganized mess I am. I see the the boarding pass from the airplane trip three years ago and, and, you know, little bits of tobacco even though I haven't had a cigarette in about 35 years and, and lipstick tops and loose ad bills and I just, I just feel that purses are, are a nightmare. They're a nightmare. That just happens to be how I feel about them. Uh, Nora remembered the advice or warning she gave me 40 years earlier when I asked her about her time uh, at Newsweek as a sort of copy girl. Newsweek, she said, it's a hard place to leave. After 40 plus years there, I still remember that. Our most entertaining entertainment segment was composed of interviews done over several years about Frank Sinatra. Um, and combined for rebroadcast the weekend after he died. You'll hear my late Sag Harbor friend and neighbor Wilfred Shee, the novelist and critic who won a Grammy for his liner notes to Sinatra's Columbia Years collection, also the cabaret singer Andrea Margovici, finally daughter Tina Sinatra, and strains of Frank himself after the repeat of the run. <laughs> and singing duets with an ever younger generation of stars who revered him as a master of popular culture and stylish celebrity. It ended last week after 82 years with a heart attack 
and Sinatra's reported refusal of extraordinary life support, leaving a vast legacy of music, movies, and memories for everyone who ever loved or lost with his songs as soundtrack. Yeah, I think, I think the thing you have to remember about Sinatra, we were all listening to the radio from morning to night in those days, and we were getting better and better at it, expecting more. And this was the best we'd ever heard. I don't think anyone had ever used a microphone as well as he had. And nobody worked with big bands better than he did. You know, whatever, whatever it was, he was the best. There are some people who think the lyrics were the, uh, were the, were the strong suit, but I really, the, the tunes were simply incredible. And, and people who would normally have been writing classical music um, all the way to that sort of side home and were simply seduced by the music because the music was doing such interesting things. It was being filled with the, uh, the improvisation of jazz. He also had a sheet about the contradictions that characterize Sinatra, a sensitive, emotional sounding board in performance, but offstage often a rude, crude, macho manipulator with legendary ties to the underworld that dominated the saloons he first played in and always enjoyed. Uh, if, you, if you see uh, the film of him making a record, you realize this is an incredibly serious man in this one respect. He's, he's, he's almost reverent about music and what he names the musicians he's playing, whether he names the songwriters. And you wouldn't even guess the other side of it. After hours, he likes to play around. He, he's, in fact, I gather, hasn't changed that much. He was always a wise guy from a book. made him so special, we turn to cabaret star Andrea Marcovici, also an actor like Sinatra. I think he started so long ago, what made him so special was that he was willing to be a male torch singer. That's what I think. I think that he was willing to show heartbreak from the male point of view. That's when it really started, the extraordinary quality of Frank Sinatra. He would just bleed over lost love, and this wasn't something I think very typical in, in the male singers. It was something very expected in the female singers. Finally, when an old Sinatra concert with Rat Pack pals Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. was broadcast on cable, we asked daughter Tina Sinatra about the old man's appeal. Forget the talent, but that's a given. That's a God-given thing. He recognized it, he, he nurtured it, and he, he sustained, uh, uh, he's had a long, good life. But I think attitude had a lot to do with it. I think that Big Crosby referred to him once, he was, he was, uh, he said, that I was sort of the pup under the porch and Frank was out chasing the cars or something like that. He just had that magnetism and energy that he he had to spend it, you know, and fortunately for all of us, he did it on a stage. And I think it's, a, it's part of the, it was his persona. I mean, he was a unique, I'll do it my way kind of guy. You should find the horrible pun. And more, what's more than this? Okay, I have one last clip to inflict on you, not from my show, but from one much earlier, 1952. In fact, it was Live Like a Millionaire, where talented parents like my late mother, a girl singer circa 1939, uh, competed for quite modest prize money after their offspring were interviewed. My radio debut. <laughs> The young gentleman in a red, blue, well, red and blue flat sports shirt and blue trousers. His name is David Alpern. Hi, Dave. Hi. You'll pardon me for taking a second to say hello to my nephew. Okay. You? How old are you, David? I want to be ten. Me too. Let's see. How, uh, how are things, big boy? Fine. You're a real husky, aren't you? How tall are you? Uh, four feet and some odd inches. Uh -huh. How much do you weigh? Um, eighty some odd pounds. Mm -hmm. You're pretty healthy, aren't you? Yeah. What keeps you healthy? Well, fresh air, food, and uh, playing. Mm -hmm. Do you know that old poem about early to so and so and so and so? Yeah. Go ahead. What was that? Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Do you think that's true, do you, son? Well, sometimes and sometimes not. <laughs> What do you do in the Cubs Cubs? Well, we go on trips, we make things. Like what? Well, we make bracelets.
bracelets and belts and uh, tie clips and mm -hmm. stuff like that. What does your mother do, son? She sings. Housewife, too, isn't it? Yeah, I think. What does your dad do? He's a salesman. What does he sell? Textiles. What are you going to be when you grow up? What's your ambition? Um, nothing too sure yet. <laughs> what appeals to you, sorry? Well, I like to, um, I'd like to learn how to fly a plane. What kind of plane? Um, Piper Cub, Navian, Beach Bear. Uh-huh. Have you ever flown? No. Uh-huh. Do you have any hobbies of any kind? Uh-huh. What? I like to ride bikes. I like to uh, make models, boats, planes, stuff uh -huh. like that. Good for you. You're a fine boy, aren't you? Well. Oh, <laughs> trying to train me, see? Who did you bring to our program to entertain us? My mother. Why did you bring her? Because she's the only one in our family that's talented. Oh! <laughs> well, your dad does lots of talent for making money for the family. I bet you can sing, can't you? Wow! Well, are you going to sing for us? No. Neither am I. Okay. <laughs> Where does mother do most of her singing, David? Um, at the piano. Oh, you have a piano at your house? Uh -huh. Oh, that's real good. All right, thanks. I'll call your mother. Let's talk to you for a second. What's that? Yeah, you were scared. Don't be scared. Supposing you had to go through life looking like I do. Well. <laughs> oh, no. So this is our housewife, right. Right? and Dad yeah. sells what, textiles? Textiles. Mm -hmm. Now, what are you going to do for us? I may be wrong, but I think you're wonderful. Well, I do too, but what are you going to sing for us? <laughs> is that the name of your song? Right. Thank you, ma'am. Try to look like a millionaire, Mrs. Libby Alpern, and you heard the title. Here we go! sticking up over his suit. He was immense. And there was a line of troops, and I positioned myself at one end to watch him shake hands and go down, where are you from, son, blah, blah, blah. And I'm diligently writing my notes when suddenly my hand is yanked off the page, and I look up into the nose hair of Lyndon Johnson, who's looking at me like, you're not immune. So he goes through whatever procedures were there, and he's going to get into his limousine, and I position myself to the rear left to see what happens. And he turns around, and he goes, and I look around to see who he's waving at. He goes, <laughs> you never forget your first vice president. <laughs> what else can I tell you? Is your show still on? No, no, no but it's... But it is listenable on the Internet Archive. I mean, if you look at the handout that you've gotten, we have all of the URLs. And you can find the original interviews. I mean, these interviews all went on for about nine or ten minutes. Um, and God bless the Internet Archive, which I mistakenly thought I was volunteering to the Library of Congress, but they had done something for the Library of Congress. And um, 
they got back within days saying, this kind of collection, I had 300 pounds of old cassettes and CDs on the landing of my apartment in New York, which Sylvia was really delighted <laughs> to get rid of. And they took it, and they have over the years digitized them and put them up, and there are a couple of months and years that are missing because Newsweek would move from one place to another and the shoebox or the sweater box would get lost. I'm hopeful that at some point I can make up that from the 20 years that the New York, that uh, Associated Press co-produced the show with us, and they of course have uh, the originals, but I think they say it's too expensive to go to the trouble of digitizing them. The Internet Archive is a great institution. I mean, it's not only radio shows, it's TV shows, it's pot. I mean, the guy who, who created it, Brewster Kale, K-H-L-E, I think, invented web crawlers. The point being that if you go to a website and then revisit it, you'll find it's changed. Well, what were they saying about this, you know, a year ago or last month? And so these web crawlers go around the, the online universe and they record at, at regular intervals what different websites are saying so that there's a, a reference point and a, and a research point. Um, and uh, they have old radio shows, they have movies, they have books, they have podcasts. It's really uh, amazing. They're, they're, uh, they're trying to rebuild the library of Alexandria on, in, in San Francisco and I think they've now started duplicating in other places, so if something should happen, they don't lose the whole connection. I think they have, a, they have one in Canada. But it's archive.org. You'll find it on the sheets that you've been given and, and pictures of some of the people we've talked to. Um, it's worth $50 or $100 a year to give. Yes? Thank you so much. This was fascinating. Yes. How do you feel about yourself? I mean, I mean, that's life. <laughs> don't, you, don't, don't you feel very um, satisfied and gratified? I'm, I'm, I'm happy with my life. <laughs> I'm pleased that I did that work. Um, I wish I played better tennis. <laughs> I'm happy that, um, that this stuff is available, and I try to call attention to it periodically if somebody famous dies. I mean, like Lee Iacocca. When, when I excerpted his book for Newsweek, I went out to Detroit and talked to him in his office, and we had him on the show several times because he was for a while a, a sort of an opinion columnist for, for Newsweek. And so by the end of the, you know, that series, he was calling me David, and it was, it was sort of friendly. But, um, but it's interesting. Uh, we had a very good run of stories on the Tiananmen Square in the weeks leading up to it, and in the week immediately <laughs> after. Um, <coughs> We had uh, Richard Holbrook on. He was out of office at that point and working on Wall Street, but a good commentator on, uh, on the issue. Um, as a footnote, you'll see a, a, a URL here. I got a, an email from the guy who edits my book reviews at The Star, a guy named Bayless Green, um, six months ago or so, saying, well, we're looking through the files and we see you wrote a review of Richard Holbrook's memoir of bringing peace to Bosnia. How would you like to write a review of, of a real biography of it? I said, well, sure. And I went back and I found the original review. And I found from this book by George Packer called yeah. Our Man, you know, how easily misled I had been. Uh, I mean, he was a guy with, with significant accomplishments, but people hated him. And for a diplomat to be so despised within his own set was, was amazing. The other thing I should say, because I, I happen to notice that Bob Carroll was here, is that my Johnson uh, meeting, again, reflected how superficial sometimes journalism can be. Here I was impressed by this huge guy and the way he handled himself, unlike Richard Nixon, who I also reported on in his sort of pre-presidential who you could never understand as a politician because he was so unequal. Well, this moment that I was so impressed by, as I read in, in, in Bob's book, was one of the low points of his career. He was vice president. He was sort of out of influence. RFK hated him. I mean, it was agony. But you wouldn't know it from the John Wayne who came down the, the gangplank of that airplane that day. What else can I tell you? Yes. I was wondering if there's somebody that you didn't have a chance to interview that you would have liked to interview. <coughs> the, the top of the list. Are we talking about alive or dead or? Uh... Um, should it be better? No. <laughs> 
Maybe he could have given me some help. Uh, oh, the world is too big a place. I mean, sure, there are always people that you'd, you'd like to get. I mean, the nice thing about the way we did this show was bad for audio quality, because we did it mostly by phone, the exceptions being Catherine Hepburn. Uh, we, did, uh, we did a few others in person. But by doing it by phone, we didn't have to wait for authors to be coming through New York, you know, for our nine minutes, you know, on their time. We could get to people pretty much when we wanted, and they were all, almost all the people who used to get interviewed for a, sto a story that week. So there was some connection, and there was some feeling that, you know, that they would be, they'd been already been cooperative, they'd be a little more cooperative. And um, so that was fine, sure. I mean, I'm sorry I, I'm sorry I never met JFK in person. I did ride with Robert Kennedy, and I have to say, I, I, I don't know if, if, uh, if Bob knows, he would ride with Robert Kennedy for every question you would ask. He would ask one or two back. I mean, he was he was he was trying to learn New York politics, so he was very interested in you know what you could tell him, or at least he 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 feigned to be, or at least he took the time to be. Uh, what he made of it, I don't know, but it was an interesting it was an interesting experience, and it was also true in that era. If you were at a fundraiser, some sort of political party in some fancy townhouse. You would know instantly when he walked in the front door, even if you were three floors up. There was a sort of an electricity that went through. He's here. He's here. It was uh, it was interesting. Um, I once rode with Nelson Rockefeller as governor, I guess, and we got stuck in the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. And poor Rockefeller was sitting with his cup reporter, was trying to. I mean, it was it was a, it was an opportunity that I of course failed to take full advantage of, and I just kept feeling sorry for, uh, for Rockefeller. The way we felt sorry for Catherine Hepper, we were having a lovely conversation, but I knew that the lady was coming from Connecticut to take her up and she had a tennis lesson or whatever. But, I mean, it was going. I mean, she was, uh, and we finally had to say, gee, Miss Hepper, I think we have to let you go. So, but there was an interesting philosophic disagreement with, with my co-host and myself. I mean, you would think a personal interview is better. Certainly, it's better personally to, to have been there, to have seen Catherine Hepburn. But in a, per, in a personal interview, a significant percentage of the information is communicated with a shrug, with a wink, with a, a gesture that gets lost on radio. And when people are doing an interview on the phone, they unconsciously know that if they're trying to make a point and be wry or be something, they have to do it with their tone of voice. They have to do it in a way that an unseen audience can appreciate because you can't say let it be noted that you know so in the end it isn't the greatest quality that that could be but we did get to people when they were in the news and timely and not on their you know particular press trip and uh, I think we got them I think you can hear in the in the Le Carre interview I mean he's communicating things that I don't know I can't say but he knew that if he wanted to get a point across, he had to do it in a way that you could hear from the sound of his voice. And uh, he was quite expert in talking. I love, I love his voice. Yes. You um, were so natural as a ten-year-old in front of that microphone. Was that at all rehearsed? It was not rehearsed. He made the mistake of saying you're a real husky. <laughs> when I was that age, and we went to shop for clothing in a departmental store in, uh, on Nostrand Avenue in Brooklyn, they would say, oh, the Husky department is over there. <laughs> so that word was just freighted for me. And as soon as he said that, I mean, I was not capable of raising a finger at that point. But I wasn't going to let this guy get the best of me. And, uh, so he really put me on edge, and I was up for trying to... He did, of, he did it. Well, <laughs> what else? Yes. I um, I found it interesting. Uh, I think it was Bernstein's assessment of you know post Watergate. You know, it can't happen again, <laughs> which was sort of interesting. He didn't. No, no. He Not says he it would happen that. again, meaning but meaning then a resignation. Yeah. That's what I'm right. talking about. Yeah. yeah that like the, it was apparent that like oh so. This man has backed himself into a corner, and he's shaved right. himself, and of course that then well, not, it should happen again. But um, that's anyway, why your I thoughts say it's, on that? It's, it's resonant <laughs> and ironic. I took out, I, 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 when, when we first agreed to do this, uh, I didn't know how much time I had. 
and I had an interview with the New Jersey congressman who was the head of the House impeachment panel. And he was pretty impressed with what they had done. And, you know, the confidence that the Constitution and that politics as we knew it could handle something like this, which Watergate had demonstrated, I'm afraid just has this not held up. And whether it will ever be restored is a question we can't answer yet. But clearly, the Republican Party is not the Republican Party that um, was able to look at the evidence in the, in the Nixon case and, uh, and vote the way they did, uh, not to mention the Supreme Court, saying that the tapes had to be re released. I mean, uh, I'm sorry I'm not doing a radio show. No, I have to say, there came a time in 2014, I guess, when things were just starting to get <coughs> bad enough, and I was doing it pretty much by myself every week pulling it together. I said, you know, this is getting grim. <laughs> and uh, uh, Sylvia and I often talk about how difficult it is for the journalists now. I mean, I wrote an, uh, an essay once online saying, what if they gave a press conference and no one came? And they've come close to that at times on, on each side. You know, we're not going to give them, we're not going to go. Um, but nobody believes the other side. Each, neither side believes the other. And it's a, it's a real charade. Um, it's interesting that when Trump made his 4th of July presidential intrusion, let's say, <laughs> the networks did not break their schedule to cover it. CNN did not break their schedule to cover it. In fact, to put their finger in its eye, they reran the, Demo the two Democratic yeah. nominee debates. So only, I'm sorry, MSNBC ran the debate, CNN ran it, covered it, and Fox, of course, covered it. Uh, there had been occasions recently, or I guess during the last year's campaign, where they would go to where Trump was speaking, and they would have him in the background, and they would have their reporter up front sort of summarizing and evaluating what his prepared remarks said or what he had already <laughs> said and how he was doing. And it seemed to me that that was beginning to show some independence and not saying that every word of his, of the president's, has to be reported live when you understand, you know, what's behind it and, and how little is behind it sometimes. So it's a real test for the, for the media um, because there's money involved. And they know that, I mean, that, that was one of the secrets of Trump's success, I think. I mean, he was, he brought eyeballs in, whatever, whatever it was, people would watch because you never knew what was going to happen, who, who, who was going to get beat up, who he was going to encourage to beat somebody. And that continues to be an issue for, uh, for them. Um, and that is one of the big tests of media. I mean, far beyond Walter Cronkite's notion of, you know, uh, anchors who worry too much about their pompadours or um, the human interest stories, which have always been part of journalism. I mean, there's some famous journalism movies where the Night City editor said, oh, and here's the story about the lost dog. That's, you know, that's always been part of it. Uh, but it's, these are tough times, economically and ethically and repertorially for, uh, for journalism. Yes, ma'am. I, I thought that was one more question over here. Oh, <coughs> yes. That was you, right? If Catherine Hepburn was your favorite interview, the favorite interview that you did, what is your least favorite person <laughs> that you interviewed? I think why? David Letterman <laughs> was in a plane when he agreed to talk with us, and somehow we offended him or whatever. And he said, oh, I think I'm about to lose the connection, and, and I think he hung up on us. And, you know, I mean, it couldn't have been anything over anything very serious. But, uh, um, and a couple of other comedians, I guess. Maybe we tried to be a little too funny in our questioning of them, and, and then we got, their, got them a little shirty. But mostly, as I say, people that we approached in the Newsweek days, had already dealt with Newsweek, and were sort of comfortable, and I mean, basically, you said, we're, we're only going to ask you to say what you said. Well, we know you, you know, and if we ventured further from that, I mean, we were, we were cautious. And certainly, we got the cooperation of the Newsweek people, 
because on Saturdays when we tape the show, um, they all had to be on call to have their stories read back to them. The magazine closed on a Saturday night. So it was perfect. I mean, they all had to wait around. They all had to have their stories read back to them for accuracy. And so for an extra you know, $100 in five minutes, they would say what they had said. And, and it, you know, in retrospect, but not in retrospect, listening to it now, it's, it's good stuff. I mean, if you go to, the, to uh, uh, on my LinkedIn site, which I have there, our little collection of Tiananmen Square previews, something's coming, something's big is about to happen, and then what happened, and what the uh, legacy might be. But that was pretty good, pretty good stuff. Um, I think our, our time has come. So I thank you very much. It's entertaining anyway. I have to say, Catherine Graham's books was one of my favorite books, and but I'd never heard her and how how like Meryl Streep yes. is. Yes, Meryl Streep. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you a good I'll tell you a good story. Meryl Streep did a great job, and I emailed uh, Donnie Graham, her son, who took over the corporation, although they don't have the newspaper anymore. They still, have and he was very admiring of the job Streep did, and I posted some of the interviews with her. On, on LinkedIn when the movie came out. Um, the Lally Weymouth that you saw in the movie yeah. is nothing like the Lally oh, Weymouth yeah. I ever ran across at the office. Uh, I mean, there she was sort of cuddlesome in her jammies and her night. Well, that's a, that's a different image. Um, but Catherine Graham did, 10 years after Watergate, she gave us the first interview about her memoir. And when her great good friend, the editorial page editor of the Washington Post, what was the name? Meg Greenfield, died just before her book was to come out. And we got the historian, I think it was Veshlas, who had worked on the book with her. And I asked Kay's secretary if Kay would, and there's no, there was no audio tape of Meg Greenfield right. speaking. I asked Kay if she would read from a graduation address that Meg had done. And the answer that came back was, tell us which part. So she was, even when it wasn't herself, she was very accommodating. She was, she was sweet. She, was, she really was a good person to work for. And uh, I, I never felt embarrassed at a meeting, you know, big story meetings. And she could make some of the editors, you know, Somebody was going off on what we should do with X-rated film wrapped around the Statue of Liberty, and she said, really? And the person with the editor of the magazine said, that's a terrible, who said that? <laughs> Subject dropped. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank